so thank you all for for coming to this talk um, uh, with the wonderful Professor Adam Lowenstein. Um, I'll just introduce Adam for a few minutes, and then Adam will go into his talk. Uh, I'll finish his talk. I'll respond, and then we'll have a conversation. Um, Adam will probably talk about this, but uh, I'm gonna stress it as well um, that uh, the intent here is to workshop. So in the sense of uh, this uh, being an, an project in process uh, for Adam, he wants to actually use this opportunity to open up questions. And I think this is a perfect setting and unfortunately perfect context to speak about Jewish horror. So um, I think uh, he would welcome uh, your opinions and perspectives, however, however horrific. So, um, so just uh, keep that in mind. Uh, we're here to talk uh, rather than just only listen. So uh, just a brief introduction about Professor Adam Lowenstein. Um, so Adam uh, works on issues relating to the cinema as a mode of historical, cultural, and aesthetic confrontation. Uh, his teaching and research link these issues to the relays between genre films and art films, uh, cinema and digital media, the politics of spectatorship and the construction of national cinemas. Uh, he has published uh, numerous peer-reviewed articles and two books through uh, Columbia University Press, Shocking Representation, Historical Trauma, National Cinema and the Modern Horror Film, and Dreaming of Cinema, Spectatorship, Surrealism in the Age of Digital Media. Um, he's especially invested in horror studies, as you well imagine. He's also the director of Pitt's Horror Studies Working Group, as well as a board member of the George A. Romero Foundation. And he's played a very important role in bringing in the Romero collection to the University of Pittsburgh's Horror Studies Archive. And he's also been recently awarded a Global Academic Partnership Grant from Pitt's Global Studies Center to build a global horror studies archival and research network. Maybe Adam will talk a little bit about that and trying to get some people involved from the Israeli end. So uh, without further ado, Adam. <laughs> thank you so much, Dan, uh, for the generous introduction. Thank you all for being here today, uh, especially since um, I'm imagining it's a still somewhat frightening and chaotic time there in Israel. And uh, I, I, I really appreciate you taking the time uh, at this time to uh, to think uh, even more about Jewish horror than you are already thinking about, um, and uh, uh, I really did want to uh, uh, thank uh, what what now feels like a a, a great group of uh, friends there at, at Tel Aviv University for uh, for making this happen um, to. Uh, to Dan Hayutin, of, of course, who uh, uh, I've had the pleasure of knowing for, for quite a few years now. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, just as I get to know him better, I, I, I like him more and more. Um, so uh, that, that, that's great. But also uh, Diana Galstian for organizing, um, of course, Boaz Hagen and, and Raz Yosef um, and, and, and others there at, at Tel Aviv University. Um, who really have made uh, Tel Aviv University a, a pretty um, amazing and welcome home away from home for me over the last several years. I've, I've, I've had the pleasure of visiting uh, several times now and, and uh, uh, I, I look forward to the next uh, in-person visit uh, as well. And um, I, I can say without exaggeration that uh, the interactions with uh, with with the colleagues at Tel Aviv University have been instrumental in giving me the the courage or the uh, 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 or at least the the delusion of courage uh, to take on a topic like the Jewish horror film. Um, so so thank you all in advance. And as Dan said, I can't imagine a better uh, workshop group uh, to do this uh, presentation of of a work in progress with on the Jewish horror film because. Uh, uh, you all are, are um, well qualified, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to tapping into that expertise. Uh, I also, before I, I got started, I wanted to uh, 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 thank my uh, 
My dad is out there in the audience today. It's his first time back at Tel Aviv University uh, in about 50 years. He uh, taught there actually um, early on in his career. Uh, so uh, uh, it only took him 50 years, but I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled that he's decided to come back as well. Uh, so um, uh, I guess with that, without uh, much further ado, I'll just say that the, the the, the frame for this talk is, is, is an introduction to a book that is not yet written, which is sort of odd because all of you have written books uh, or are in the process of writing books or imagine writing books, know that the introduction is the last thing you write, not the first thing you write, because the introduction is, is what gives a rationale for everything you've put together in the book as a whole. So to write an introduction before the book is actually written is, is a somewhat uh, uh, odd thing to do, but, but I wanted to do it for you uh, today because I wanted to give you a snapshot of my thinking currently about this book, which I'm uh, tentatively calling uh, The Jewish Horror Film, Taboo and Redemption. Um, and, and I wanted to give a sort of overview of how I'm imagining the book right now because I know the imagination will change uh, lots in, in, the, in, the, in the months and years to come. And, uh, and I'm banking that this conversation with you all will, will change the shape of it as well. So I wanted to give you a sense of where my thinking is at uh, without any sense that, you know, um, you saying something like, well, that chapter doesn't sound like it's gonna it's gonna fit. Uh, I'm not sure that's gonna work. And how could you not have a chapter on X or Y or Z? That's the whole intention, right? And 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 Israelis, I, I know you'll tell me that uh, <laughs> honestly and frankly. Um, so uh, uh, I, I I I have built this on the model of a uh, a work in progress, a workshop, a conversation ideas in progress rather than, you know, here is my finished thinking on this subject and, and I, will, I will destroy all comers who, who, who dare to say that it is not the right and authoritative word on the Jewish horror film, okay? So it's open, not closed. Uh, okay. Um, I'm really looking forward to our discussion and, uh, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to Dan's response and I'm looking forward to hearing from all of you uh, about your, your thoughts about this, uh, this topic and this, uh, this, this talk today. Um, so uh, without further ado, let me, let me get to the talk. Um, okay. Uh, my talk begins um, with uh, uh, a, um, an epigraph. And um, the epigraph is, is, is from the, uh, the great German Jewish uh, film critic and film theorist, uh, Siegfried Krakauer. Um, and this is uh, from an essay he wrote in 1947 uh, uh, called On Jewish Culture. And uh, I feel like this epigraph is sort of the keystone to the whole project, uh, uh, both today's talk, which is entitled Exploring the Jewish Horror Film, and uh, the book as a whole, which, which, which again is titled The Jewish Horror Film, Taboo and Redemption. So here's what Krakauer had to say uh, from his vantage point in, in, in America in 1947. And yet self-interest alone however justified, would not suffice to explain completely the inspired zeal with which Jewish scholars and artists try constantly to overcome the stubborn resistance of sheer matter and prejudiced tradition. There is something religious in this sustained effort to remove barriers and penetrate taboo zones, this effort to dissipate narrow-mindedness and cause not a single stone to withhold its meaning. In our Western world, the cause of enlightenment is the cause of the Jews. And it is as if the best of them championed it in the belief that their salvation was inseparable from the redemption of humanity as a whole. 
Now we switch to me from Krakauer. Why study the Jewish horror film? The great German Jewish film theorist and cultural critic Siegfried Krakauer, born in 1889, died 1966, helps us to see why answering this question has deeper and more pressing stakes than it may at first appear. The answer cannot only be a matter of addressing the blind spots in fields such as film studies, Jewish studies, and horror studies that have thus far failed to produce a book length analysis of the Jewish horror film. These blind spots do indeed exist, and this book seeks to illuminate them. But turning to the Jewish horror film also invites us, however unexpectedly, to wrestle with precisely those issues of taboo and redemption that haunted Krakauer during his post-Holocaust career. Krakauer, like so many other Jews of his time and place, faced anti-Semitic persecution in Hitler's Germany that would have eventually escalated to the threat of extermination if he had not left the country. Unlike many of his fellow Jews, he was able to survive. He fled first to France and then to the United States. When he arrived in America in 1941, he embarked on a writing career in a new language and a new country that eventually produced his two most well-known books, From Caligari to Hitler, A Psychological History of the German Film, published 1947, and Theory of Film, The Redemption of Physical Reality, published in 1960. After many years of critical neglect, these books have returned more recently to places of prominence in contemporary film studies debates concerning realism, affect, spectatorship, trauma, and the representation of history. In fact, renewed scholarly interest in Krakauer's career as a whole has resulted in welcome translations and ambitious critical commentaries on everything from his Weimar writings to his American criticism beyond from Caligari to Hitler and theory of film. Krakauer's ascension from the margins of the Frankfurt School to a much more central position beside colleagues such as Theodore Adorno and Walter Benjamin is already well underway and only promises to gain further momentum. But few scholars have attempted to connect Krakauer to the horror film, let alone the Jewish horror film. During the process of writing my third book, Horror Film and Otherness, Transforming Horror Studies, which is currently completed and under review, I realized that the Jewish horror film was far more significant to the history of the horror genre than we have previously imagined. In that book, I developed an alternate theoretical approach to horror's engagement with social otherness. While most critics have assumed that the horror film thrives negatively on otherness by portraying minoritized social others as monsters, I argued that horror is more accurately understood as activating what I called transformative otherness the presentation of distinctions between normal self and monstrous other, not as strict divisions at all, but as entwined, constantly metamorphosing categories. By seeing through horror, the lens of trans seeing horror through the lens of transformative otherness, a genealogy for what I called horror's minority vocabulary emerges. In this tradition, horror serves not to demonize social others, but to articulate their lived pain in ways that majority society tends to minimize or dismiss entirely. Perhaps the most famous contemporary example of horror's transformative otherness is Jordan Peele's Academy Award-winning blockbuster, Get Out, from 2017. Peele's brilliant adaptation of horror genre tropes to capture the anguish of racism for the African-American experience is well known, but what is West less widely acknowledged, even though Peele admits it himself, is how Get Out is inspired by a model of horror pioneered by the Jewish American author, Ira Levin. As the author of Rosemary's Baby, The Stepford Wives and The Boys from Brazil, Levin crafted an experience of horror that fit the post-Holocaust Jewish American experience of social otherness, a Western world sympathetic to Jews and ostensibly committed to guaranteeing the Holocaust will never again occur, yet also a world where persistent anti-Semitism and white supremacy exist in ways that are often masked or ignored. But sometimes anti-Semitism becomes impossible to ignore, as it did on October 27, 2018 in my own city of Pittsburgh. It was in 2018, not some dark moment in the distant past, that the deadliest anti-Semitic attack in American history took place. A racist gunman invaded Pittsburgh's Tree of Life synagogue during Shabbat services, murdering 11 people while wounding six others. The language I needed to overcome my personal fear and rage as a Jew in the wake of Tree of Life came from the horror film and from Krakauer. October 1st, 2018 happened to mark the 50th anniversary of George Romero's Night of the Living Dead, perhaps the most important independent horror film of the modern era, 
and restored by the Museum of Modern Art for the occasion. Since much of my scholarship has focused on the social significance of the horror film, and since Romero spent most of his career in Pittsburgh, I played a central role in forging alliances between the city's major universities, museums, and cultural institutions to observe the anniversary of night as an occasion for intellectual reflection on horror's role as a social force. Romero's recent passing on July 16, 2017, made it all the more important to celebrate not only the anniversary of the film, but Romero's legendary career as a whole. It felt as if the entire city was pulling together to honor Pittsburgh's most influential and beloved filmmaker. Our success was dramatic beyond my most optimistic hopes. A citywide festival celebrating Romero launched with a major press conference where Pittsburgh's mayor officially designated October 1st, 2018 as George A. Romero Day. Generous coverage in local and national news media, including the New York Times, the founding of the nonprofit George A. Romero Foundation, of which I'm now a board member, uh, and the acquisition of the George A. Romero Collection by the Uni University of Pittsburgh's library system to establish the world's first horror studies archive. Of course, all of this success came crashing down around me when the Tree of Life massacre threatened my very sense of belonging as a Jew in my own city, in my own country. I was reminded of my own vulnerability, my own otherness in wrenchingly painful ways. But reading Krakauer, who endured a much more shattering experience of Jewish otherness in his own life, and immersing myself in Romero's films, where horror is never simply a matter of zombies or vampires, but the tragedy of human beings failing to recognize each other as fully human, gave me the strength to go on. I committed myself to completing horror film and otherness as a form of testimony to the Tree of Life experience. And I hope the Jewish horror film, Taboo and Redemption, can speak even more specifically to those terms that Krakauer juxtaposed so courageously in 1947. Jewishness, taboo, redemption, enlightenment, humanity. To accomplish this mission, <clears throat> this book aims to serve as both a selective history of the Jewish horror film and a provocation about what the category of Jewish horror film might mean. Jewish horror is not always made by Jews, nor does it always represent Jews or Jewishness explicitly, nor does it always draw on the conventions of the horror genre in traditional ways. Instead, the Jewish horror film emerges at the crossroads of these qualities, connecting discourses of horror to a cinematic imaginary surrounding questions of Jewishness. Not all writers or directors of Jewish horror could be included in this book, due to space constraints, including such prominent figures as Darren Aronofsky and Roman Polanski. In terms of outlining a history of Jewish horror, the goal was to choose straight cases strategically rather than attempt an exhaustive account. I should also note at the outset that the Jewish horror film has taken shape primarily as a male-focused phenomenon in terms of its key creators. This is not to say that women are somehow superfluous to the stories that Jewish horror films tell. On the contrary, they are essential. But the absence of women as writers and directors of these stories is undeniable and regrettable. This absence is also not entirely surprising given that women have been historically underrepresented as commercial film directors in general and as directors of the horror genre in particular. This situation is changing with a post 2000 explosion of women directed horror films, but this shift has not yet reached the precincts of Jewish horror. A, a heartening development is the contemporary presence of women among the popular critics of Jewish horror. So hopefully it is, not only, it is only a matter of time before more women move from the realms of criticism to those of filmmaking. The fifth chapter and conclusion of this book turns to the gendered dimensions of Jewish horror by focusing on, two, on a 2018 Israeli version of the Golem that highlights feminist issues as well as by engaging with the major German Jewish philosopher Hannah Arendt as the rare woman working alongside Frankfurt school figures like Benjamin Adorno and Krakauer Arendt's influential concepts of evil lend an important theoretical dimension to Jewish horror. So that's the preamble. And now I'm going to go into descriptions of the chapters of, of the book. Chapter one studies the canonical origins of the Jewish horror film in Weimar Germany and pre-Holocaust Poland. Germany's The Golem uh, from 1920 and Nosferatu uh, from 1922 as well as the earlier The Student of Prague from 1913, rely on Jewish coded otherness for their horror, while the Polish Yiddish The Dybbuk from 1937 
mines Judaism's own horror folklore for its tale of spiritual possession of life beyond death. Seeing these films through the theoretical framework offered by Krakauer requires not only revisiting his readings of most of them in From Caligari to Hitler, but honoring his conviction shared by his friend Walter Benjamin that critical responsibility toward history is a matter of strategic collision between past and present on which future depends. Krakauer's commitment to inciting such collisions through his work has not been as widely recognized as Benjamin's, but returning to From Caligari to Hitler and Theory of Film in light not only of his posthumously published history, The Last Things Before the Last, but his post-emigration American essays provides the theoretical means to juxtapose these early films with later ones. For Krakauer in America, the stakes of his work always revolved around social criticism, often but not always involving film, that endeavored to warn against potentially destructive social tendencies in America that recall those of Hitler's Germany, including anti-Semitism. For example, in his important essay, Hollywood's Terror Films, Do They Reflect an American State of Mind from 1946, Krakauer maps an evolution in wartime and early post-war American cinematic horror where, quote, the weird veiled insecurity of life under the Nazis is transferred to the American scene, unquote. Krakauer calls these dark films horror thrillers and traces their lineage back to, quote, the Frankenstein monsters of the past, unquote. But today we would call many of them film noir, Shadow of a Doubt, Dark Corner, Lost Weekend, The Spiral Staircase. Given Krakauer's thesis concerning the layering of German, American, and wartime post-war elements in these films, it is striking how heavily his major examples lean on emigre directors and German Jewish emigres in particular, uh, Billy Wilder and, and Robert Siodmak uh, uh, explicitly, Directors who are, like Krakauer, living simultaneously between two worlds of experience, two intertwined histories, two versions of Jewish identity that must be reckoned with, even if never reconciled, in order to, for a future to be imagined from the ashes of the past and the anxieties of the present. In Krakauer's critical practice, past, present, and future are always intersecting layers of history, rather than straightforwardly distinct, chronologically linear categories. In other words, Krakauer's American work seeks, however provisionally or implicitly, to inhabit the position toward history embodied for him by Ahash Verish, the legendary wandering Jew, cursed to roam eternally throughout historical time. Krakauer invokes Ahash Verish to resolve the impossible antinomies of history between chronological and non-chronological time. Quote, for he alone in all history has had the unsought opportunity to experience the process of becoming and decaying himself." Unquote. Krakauer imagines the face of Ahasuerush as, quote, many faces, each reflecting one of the periods which he traversed and all of them combining into ever new patterns, unquote. These many faces of multiple temporalities housed within the single metamorphosing visage of Ahasuerush is, for Krakauer, the face of history as well as the face of horror. How, un, quote, how unspeakably terrible he must look, Krakauer exclaims. The many faces of Ahasuerus, the wandering Jew, is the stuff of legend, but it is also, as Krakauer knew well, the stuff of cinema. In fact, Ahasuerus makes a brief but unforgettable appearance in Paul Wagner's The Golem, when the Jewish rabbi shares, the Gentile, uh, shares with the Gentile emperor and his court a magical window onto the Jewish past that can only be called cinematic. It is a living past projected as screened images for a mass of spectators. But despite the rabbi's warnings, the Gentile spectators laugh disrespect, disrespectfully at the face of Ahasuerus. Suddenly the projection becomes something more than cinema, something closer to the past's living interpenetration of the present. As Ahasuerus hears the mocking laughter of the Gentiles, and becomes more aware of their intrusive gaze. As Krakauer observes in his reading of this specific scene, Ahasuerus, quote, proceeds to trespass on the domain of reality, unquote. In his rage, Ahasuerus steps out of the past and into the present by causing the emperor's palace to collapse. Only the golem prevents lethal catastrophe by holding the palace together with superhuman strength. But the faces of Ahasuerus cannot be forgotten. They testify to the presence of history in the present and anti-Semitic history specifically. 
The golem and Ahasuerus have shocked the emperor into an awareness, however limited and self-serving, of Jewish humanity across time, forcing him to revoke his anti-Semitic edict of expelling the Jews from their homes in the Jewish ghetto. Krakauer's American criticism is similarly dedicated to staging these historically disorienting encounters with the value and precarity of Jewish life, where the German past and the American present converge in order to imagine a better future that exceeds each. Chapter one follows Krakauer's lead by turning to the Polish horror film Demon from 2015, a reimagining of the Dybbuk, as well as George A. Romero's unproduced script for his own remake of The Golem, which is available in the George A. Romero collection. Juxtaposing these newer or even unrealized films, a future still awaiting fulfillment, alongside the older canonical ones, permits the past and present to illuminate each other, demonstrating how the Jewish horror film is a phenomenon not just of yesterday, but today, as well as yesterday, today, and tomorrow together. Chapter two studies the career of Kurt Siadmak, uh, born 1902, died 2000, a German Jewish screenwriter and novelist who like Krakauer was forced to flee Hitler's Germany and eventually emigrated to the United States in 1937 after failed attempts at refuge in Switzerland, France, and England. Perhaps even more so than Krakauer, this traumatic experience of persecuted Jewishness haunted all of Siadmak's subsequent life and work. Siadmak is most well known as the screenwriter of The Wolfman, 1941, and the author of the thrice filmed science fiction horror novel, Donovan's Brain from 1942. The extraordinary influence of these texts still very much with us today, encouraged me to argue for their status as foundational texts for understanding Jewish horror in horror film and otherness. Here I will expand that argument by connecting these texts to Siadmak's other notable contributions to the history of the classic horror film, including work on screenplays for many sequels in the iconic horror series launched by the Universal Studios productions, Dracula, Frankenstein, The Invisible Man, and The Wolfman. Siadmak also wrote, co-wrote the screenplay for Val Luton's I Walked with a Zombie in 1943, perhaps Hollywood's most ambitious exploration of the zombie in its black Afro-Caribbean context. Giving Siadmak's remarkable career the critical tension that has, attention that has eluded it thus far, mostly due to his commitment to the underappreciated horror and science fiction genres and being overshadowed by his more famous brother, director Robert Siadmak, with whom he collaborated on the important 1930 documentary fiction experiment, People on Sunday, along with fellow Jewish filmmakers, Eugene Shuftan, Edgar Ulmer, Billy Wilder, and Fred Zinneman extends the history of the Jewish horror film in significant ways. These extensions reach into the past uh, as Dracula and Frankenstein draw heavily on Nosferatu and the Golem, as well as the future. The Wolfman created the horror genre's most durable, allegorically Jewish monster, the Jewish werewolf. Chapter three explores the evolution of the Jewish werewolf from its allegorical beginnings in the Wolfman to its more explicitly Jewish manifestations in John Landis's An American Werewolf in London from 1981 and Philippe Mora's The Beast Within from 1982. Landis and Mora, both Jewish directors, channel their personal Jewish experience as well as their deep familiarity with Siadmak's The Wolfman into these graphically stunning portraits of what the Wolfman could only suggest. What the transformation of man into wolf or man into wolfish insect in the case of The Beast Within. And if you haven't seen that transformation, I warned you, uh, what, what that transformation looks and feels like. Landis and Mora, working with the special makeup effects masters, Rick Baker and Thomas R. Berman, respectively, refigure horror's encounter with Jewish otherness by visualizing so intently and, and unyieldingly what has always been at the core of Jewish horror, transformation itself. Whether it is the transformation of a Jew who passes for a Gentile into a Jew who can no longer pass as Gentile, or the transformation of a socially accepted Jew into a socially persecuted Jew, as Siadmak and Krakauer experienced so dramatically in their own lives, or the allegorical transformation of a human being into a subhuman animal. The bottom line is that transformation is essential to Jewish horror in both its lived and cinematic guises. Landis, with his profound connections to traditions of Jewish humor, as well as Jewish horror, through comedic blockbusters like Animal House, Trading Places, and Coming to America, and Mora, whose fascinating and critically neglected career encompasses everything 
from the pioneering Australian bushranger, Western mad dog Morgan, to documentaries on the experience of his parents as Holocaust survivors, furnished the tools to ground Jewish horror in concepts of transformation. Theoretical support for these concepts is provided by two trailblazing Austrian Jewish thinkers, Sigmund Freud and Robert Eisler. Freud's Totem and Taboo from 1913, Beyond the Pleasure Principle from 1920, and From the History of an Infantile Neurosis from 1913, which is also commonly known as the Wolfman case study, uh, along with Eisler's Man into Wolf, an anthropological interpretation of sadism, masochism, and lycanthropy from 1948, shed critical light on the spectacles of transformation so central to the Jewish horror film by rooting them in psychology and anthropology. Freud and Eisler also lived parallel lives to Krakauer and Siadmak in terms of their Jewishness. Freud died in exile in London after fleeing the Nazis, while Eisler's death was the delayed result of physical damage he sustained while imprisoned in the concentration camps of Dachau and Buchenwald. Chapter four excavates the relationship between Jewish horror and Jewish humor begun in the previous chapter. In horror film and otherness, I touched on the career of the Jewish American author, Ira Levin, most famous, as I mentioned earlier, for writing the seminal horror novels, Rosemary's Baby, The Stepford Wives, and The Boys from Brazil. In this chapter, I cast Levin's contributions to Jewish horror in a different light by pairing him with a far more famous Jewish American novelist who is almost his exact contemporary in terms of time 1930s to the 2000s, and Place, New York and New Jersey. And I'm talking, of course, about Philip Roth, born 1933, died 2018. Even though Levin provided the source material for vastly popular and influential films, and, then, and in the case of Rosemary's Baby, one of the best films directed by the brilliant but deeply controversial Polish-Jewish Holocaust survivor, Roman Polanski, he never secured the literary acclaim of Roth. Although Roth's literary fiction never produced a horror novel in the conventional generic sense, his alternate history of American Nazification in the plot against America from 2004 bears strong resemblances to the boys from Brazil. Less obviously, but still compelling, compellingly, Roth's American Pastoral from 1997 and Levin's Rosemary's Baby both focus on monster children, while Roth's The Human Stain from 2000 and Levin's The Stepford Wives both approach questions regarding the cost of shared social otherness across Jewish, black, and female identities. I'm not proposing that Levin directly influenced Roth, but that their shared qualities as Jewish American authors with origins in a shared time and place enable us to learn things about their work through juxtaposition that would be impossible when keeping them safely separated according to the conventional designations of genre fiction and literary fiction. In a major study of Roth's work, Ross Posnock has characterized Roth's literary achievement as, as quote unquote, rude truth, an art of immaturity that emerges not from the obliteration of bourgeois restraint, but from pushing or defying its limits and by being judged against, against a presiding norm, unquote. Despite Posnock's desire to distance Roth from the particularities of his Jewish New Jersey centered life and work, I believe this formulation of rude truth is productive for understanding the intersection between Jewish humor and Jewish horror, embedded not only by Roth, but by Levin as well. The satirical nature of Levin's horror has gone as unremarked as the horrific nature of Roth's rudeness. But in terms of cinema, the encapsulation of this Jewish horror humor based in rude truth does not reside in any adaptation of novels by Roth or Levin. Instead, it belongs to a Jewish Canadian filmmaker whose work has rarely been discussed in relation to Jewishness. And here I'm referring to David Cronenberg. For Cronenberg, horror is so stubbornly literal in its rude attachment to the body that a Kafka-esque strain of existential humor is never far behind. And Kafka, himself a deeply Jewish author whose work refrains from mentioning Jews, has perhaps never been as close to the surface of Cronenberg's work as in his horror film, The Fly from 1986. Indeed, it would not be inaccurate to refer to Cronenberg's tale of a man's monstrous fusion with a housefly as his version of Kafka's novella, The Metamorphosis from 1915, where a man awakes to find himself transformed into a human-sized insect. The horror and humor in these literalized scenarios of transformation, as well as their rich allegorical evocations of Jewish experience as becoming inexplic inexplic inexplicably subhuman 
in the eyes of anti-Semitic society, Bond, Kafka, and Cronenberg. But it is also worth noting that Roth attempts his own rude version of the metamorphosis in his novella, The Breast from 1972. And that the production company behind The Fly is none other than Brooks Films, headed by the legendarily rude Jewish comedian and filmmaker, Mel Brooks. In short, this chapter will explore Jewish horror and humor by enacting critically what the molecular transmitting telepods in the fly achieve cinematically, a fusion of Levin, Roth, and Cronenberg with dashes of Kafka and Brooks added. It's gonna be quite a monster, right? Okay, chapter five approaches the contemporary Jewish American horror film through its two most prominent directors, Eli Roth and Ari Aster. Roth is most well known as the enfant tarib protege of Quentin Tarantino, bursting onto the scene with the audaciously graphic hits Cabin Fever from 2003 and Hostel from 2006. Roth has struggled with disappointing projects in more recent years, but his notoriety as a major force in the horror genre remains strong, and it has been complemented by his appearances as an actor, especially in Tarantino's films. In his most notable role, Roth plays Sergeant Donnie Donowitz, also known as the Bear Jew, in Tarantino's Inglorious Bastards from 2009 the most physically brutal of the avenging Jews who drive Tarantino's contribution to an alternative imaginary surrounding the Holocaust alongside works such as The Boys from Brazil and The Plot Against America. In many ways, Ari Aster is the inverse of Eli Roth, drawn to quiet, almost chamber drama structured meditations on psychologically centered horror rather than Roth's broad, spectacularly graphic style. Yet Astor's hits Hereditary from 2018 and Midsummer from 2019 have their own unexpected eruptions of shocking violence that can hold their own with Roth's aesthetic, just as Roth's films and Hostel in particular can meld their spectacle horror with provocative, often overlooked political commentary. In short, Roth and Astor are both taboo breakers, even if Roth prefers pushing the envelope of horror's body-oriented graphic address and Astor prefers stretching the boundaries between generic horror and the psychologically oriented ruminations of the art film. Neither Roth nor Astor has yet spoken at length concerning the influence of their Jewishness on their horror films, but the echoes of the Holocaust in the Eastern European concentration camp-like setting of Hostel and the white supremacist connotations of the menacing Swedish cult in Midsummer suggest that interviews with them focused on this subject may yield important new insights concerning their work. My goal for these interviews will be to pose questions to Roth and Astor that allow them to speak about their well-known accomplishments in the horror genre alongside their little known experience as Jews. My hope is that the responses to such questions paired with rigorous analysis of their films may aid us in seeing them not only as leading auteurs of the horror film, but as key innovators of contemporary Jewish horror. The sixth and final chapter uh, turns to con contemporary Jewish-Israeli horror. The success of Aharon Kishalis and Navot Kapushado's horror films Rabies from 2010 and Big Bad Wolves from 2013 have been widely received in the popular press as the birth of the Israeli horror film. Although this label is not entirely accurate historically, there is no doubt that Kishalis and Papushado have enabled a wave of Israeli horror more robust and diverse than any seen before in the country's history. Yet the modest critical attention devoted to Kishalis and Papushado thus far has he heavily favored interpretation of their films as Israeli horror rather than Jewish horror. This chapter challenges that designation by framing the two feature films of Kishalis and Papushado beside Papushado's little known student thesis film Zeitgeist from 2007. As Papushado explained to me in an extensive recent interview, his collaboration with Kishalis began when Papushado was a student and Kishalis a professor at Tel Aviv University's prestigious Steve Tisch School of Film and Television. Hope it sounds familiar. So Zeitgeist, directed by Papushado and Guy Raz, produced by Kishalis, a fascinating film where Jewish concentration camp ghosts become visible only through the lens of a Nazi-owned camera discovered in today's Israel, forms an essential but hitherto unknown foundation for the later films of Kishalis and Papushado. The fact that Papushado's family is of German Jewish heritage, he's actually a dual citizen of Israel and Germany, and escaped the Holocaust through forced emigration like Krakauer and Siadmak, places him squarely within the tradition of the Jewish horror film. 
Aside from Kishales and Papushado, perhaps the most notable contributors to contemporary Jewish-Israeli Jewish horror are the directors Doran and Yoav Paz. The two brothers have co-directed both the zombie film Jerusalem from 2015, as well as a remake of The Golem from 2018. Given its direct connection to the cinematic context of Weimar Germany studied in chapter one, I will focus on The Golem. The Paz version of this Jewish tale is most striking for its inclusion of what has been marginal in both the mythology of the golem and the Jewish horror film in general, women. This chapter seeks to address and redress this absence by analyzing the gender dimensions of the golem, where it is a non-ordained Jewish woman, not a male rabbi, who creates the golem in the shape of her own dead son. As in Wagner's version, this golem both saves and threatens to destroy the Jewish community from which it springs. But in the Paz version, this paradox of Jewish self-protection and self-destruction is shot through with issues of female empowerment and oppression that are decidedly contemporary, despite the film's setting in the Lithuania of 1673. In fact, when the golem and Zeitgeist are taken together, the subject of Jewish horror's relations to difficult questions concerning post-Holocaust Jewish community and national Israeli identity emerge. These were questions on Krakauer's mind in the post-war period, but they were taken up much more com comprehensively and controversially by his fellow German-Jewish emigre, Hannah Arendt. The nexus between Krakauer and Arendt on the topic of post-Holocaust evil will form the theoretical backdrop for this chapter and lead towards the book's conclusion. The, clu the conclusion will reflect on the Jewish horror film's existence between the terms of taboo and redemption set out by Krakauer in On Jewish Culture in 1947. Although this essay went unpublished during Krakauer's lifetime, it was written at the invitation of the major Jewish intellectual periodical commentary for a forum of responses to founder editor Elliot Cohen's uh, Jewish Culture in America, some speculations by an editor from 1947. Among the other respondents was Hannah Arendt. Although Arendt's philosophical concepts of radical evil from her 1951, The Origins of Totalitarianism and the banality of evil from her 1963, Eichmann in Jerusalem are much more well known, Krakauer also wrote of evil as a key concept undergirding his post-war film and cultural theory. For example, in those movies with a message from 1948, he exhorts us, exhorts us to acknowledge that quote, evil does exist and it cannot be drowned in bright visions, unquote. Krakauer continues, quote, blank opposition to evil is futile. Evil yields only to an embrace, to a change in the substance of what cannot otherwise be conquered, unquote. What Krakauer's notion of evil shares with Arendt's is the conviction that, particularly after the Holocaust, evil cannot be dispensed with as simply monstrous. Instead, evil must be engaged and fought through an embrace, what Krakauer describes as a, quote, fully orchestrated reasoning that comes to grips with the dark powers that impatiently lie in wait to close in on us and lives on intimate terms with them, unquote. What the Jewish horror film puts into practice is Krakauer's theory that for evil to be combated, it must first be embraced and lived with on intimate terms. If evil is only monstrous, then it has nothing to do with us, with humanity. In other words, even if evil acts cannot be redeemed, they must be acknowledged and prevented from happening again by breaking taboos around our conception of evil's proximity to us and within us. This is the redemption that the Jewish horror film ultimately offers, a recognition that, that we are all capable of evil, that evil is not solely the province of monsters and that we can learn profound things about evil through cinematic monsters. There's an important moment in Krakauer's theory of film where he turns to quote, fantastic monsters in films, such as the Frankenstein monster, King Kong, the Wolfman, unquote. Although he critiques the unrealistic, uncinematic staginess of some of these films, he also allows for something else. These monsters quote, may be staged so skillfully that they merge with their real life environment and evoke the illusion of being virtually real. Is nature not capable of spawning monsters?" Unquote. The Jewish horror film answers Krakauer's question over and over again with a resounding, hauntingly urgent yes, spoken between taboo 
and redemption. Thank you. Thank you, Adam, uh, for a wonderful talk and uh, um, a wonderful opportunity to workshop your ideas. And I hope everybody in the audience uh, is now uh, jotting down uh, everything you think Adam wants to know about Jewish horror, but was afraid to ask. Um, uh, so I will give you some time with, with my response to, to gather your thoughts. Um, and I wanted to start um, uh, picking up on a thread that uh, Adam outlined, uh, not so much with proper horror, but with proper humor. And uh, while I was reading Adam's abstract for the book, um, I was reminded of a notable skit by a uh, master comedian, Lenny Bruce, Jewish comedian, Lenny Bruce, um, with uh, which, with your indulgence um, and forgiveness for foul language, but we are dealing with taboos, um, I'll quote it late. And I'm doing a disservice to Lenny Bruce, but bear with me. <clears throat> Dick. I'm Jewish. Count Basie's Jewish. Ray Charles is Jewish. Eddie Cantor's Goyish. Nebrit is Goyish. Hadassah, Jewish. Marine Corps heavy Goyim, dangerous. Kool Aid is Goyish. All Drake's cakes are Goyish. Pumpernickel is Jewish. And as you know, white bread is very Goyish. Instant potatoes, Goyish. Black cherry soda is very Jewish. Macaroons are very Jewish, a very Jewish cake. Fruit salad is Jewish, lime jello is goyish, lime soda is very goyish. Trailer parks are so goyish that Jews won't go near them. Jack Parr show is very goyish. Underwear is definitely goyish. Balls are goyish, titties are Jewish, mouths are Jewish. All Italians are Jewish. Greeks are goyish, bad some. Eugene O'Neill, Jewish, Dylan Thomas, Jewish. Steve is goyish though. It's the hair, he combs his hair in the boys room with that soap all the time. Lewis, that's my name in Jewish, Lewis Schneider. Why haven't you got Lewis Schneider up on the marquee? Well, cause it's not show business, it doesn't fit. No, no, I don't wanna hear that. You Jewish? Yeah. You ashamed of it? Yeah. Why are you ashamed you're Jewish? I'm not anymore, but it used to be a problem. So at the heart of Bruce's topology stands a nagging question. How do you define Jewish? As it turns out, the answer he gives is far from commonplace. Rather than rely on the state parameters of established tradition, Bruce asks us to abandon them and submit to a logic of categorization that seems known only to him. We may offer speculations as to why Italians are Jewish and Greeks are Goyish, but this seems hardly the point. Rather, what we are prompted to accept is the very fluidity of Jewishness over and against the constant desire of Jews and many Goyish to see it be stabilized. To call this desire uh, may perhaps put a positive spin on an otherwise sinister impulse, for as nebulous as the category of Jewish may appear in Bruce's monologue, what drives the act of categorization appears unequivocal. Shame, fear, the shadow of horror. The complex bond between the Jewish and the horrific is what Adam searches after. And for this purpose, he returns to a longstanding source of inspiration where horror and Jewishness often intersect, the Frankfurt School of German philosophy. Specifically, a lesser known essay on Jewish culture by Siegfried Krakauer provides the key for approaching this topic from a new perspective. Krakauer's definition for Jewishness, like Bruce's, is anything but dogmatic and is willing to include in its confines all that constitutes, and again I quote, a sustained effort to remove barriers and penetrate taboo zones, to dissipate narrow mindedness and cause not a single stone to withhold its meaning. Through Krak Krakauer, horror becomes the keystone of Jewishness when it professes an acknowledgement of our intimacy, if not our intertwining with the evil and the abject. It is this favoring of the broadly ethical over the narrowly ethnic that allows Adam to push the boundaries of Jewish horror beyond the strict limits of creative works that are made by Jews and or represent Jews. 
I would nevertheless ask us to linger for a moment on what ties this broad ethical position to the more familiar coordinates of Jewish tradition, or rather to a particular vision of Judaism. Here I also follow Krakauer, who notes that this effort to remove barriers and penetrate taboos has, quote unquote, something religious. If we are to interpret religious in terms of Jewish religion, then Krakauer's caveat seems peculiar. For as Mary Douglas's famous discussion of Leviticus instructs us, early Judaic thought was very much invested in the idea of separation rather than interpenetration. Making distinctions between the pure and the impure in this context was not an everyday necessity, but a symbolic gesture, which sets apart divinity as the area of untouched perfection and all outside of it is carrying the dangers of imperfection. Ancient kosher laws serve as a prime example for this dynamic in the sense that they, to quote Douglas, are like signposts prompting the believer to think about the unity, purity, and perfectness of God as at every turn, end quote. Thus, by, abs by abstaining from certain animals and marking them, them off as taboo, Jews could, and again I quote, give a physical expression to the divine and align themselves with its purity at every meal. Yet because God is inherently separate from humankind, an alignment cannot be complete. So in order to come to terms with this painful understanding or rather disavow it, the ritual of rejecting the object is made to encompass all facets of life and is pursued religiously. Krakauer articulates an alternate form of Judaism, and as such is no different than many other Jewish philosophers of the interwar period like Benjamin and Levinas, who detached themselves from unquestioning obedience to Judaic dogma. All these thinkers searched for a spiritual dimension that substituted separation for proximity and found what they were looking for in Jewish mysticism, namely the Kabbalah. Importantly, it is not so much a matter of finding as reimagining that was at play here. From Kabbalah and Hasidism, through the particular mediation of Martin Buber, neo-mystical Jewish philosophy disproportionately highlighted the prospect of revelation through contact with the physical, or rather of the physical as co-implicating human and God in an uneven yet very intimate relationship. This prospect is what motivates key ideas like Benjamin's now time, yes tide, or Levinas's face-to-face -face, or Paul de face au face. It also frames Krakauer's emphasis in theory of film on how, and I quote him, films come to their own when they record and reveal physical reality. For Krakauer, it's, it is not the consecration of cinema that matters, but the consecration in quasi-Hasidic fashion of materiality through cinema, of things unveiled quote unquote, in their fullness through an unfamiliar perspective that only the cinematic image can provide. That in this study, the process of unveiling is connected to the terms of redemption, as Adam points out, clearly testifies to the messianic bent of Krakauer's and his peers' peculiar and particular brand of neo-mysticism. To redeem oneself in this context is to overcome the distance from what Krakauer defines as moments of everyday life. Distances here are far more conceptual than they are concrete. Consequently, by their abolishment, we are made to discover ourselves always already connected in a greater unity. A family of man, to use Krakauer's terminology, which subtly echoes the messianic goal of achieving union mystica. Now, if my short description of Krakauer's neo-mysticism shows it at its most hopeful, then this hope is not achieved at the cost of excluding the horrific. Quite to the contrary. Within his messianic logic, to preserve separation between categories of pure and impure may keep one safe, but not redeemed. The path toward redemption, in contrast, must transcend such distinctions, and in so doing, should also embrace the dangerous and terrorizing into the redemptive experience. Through an effort to remove barriers and penetrate taboo zones, we come to realize firsthand that every deliverance is also an apocalypse. This is the painful lesson that something religious, which Jewish war teaches. What then are we to do with this lesson? Such may be the central question posed by the horror films in Adam's book. 
for Krakauer, at least, there are no good answers, but one is significantly better than the other. We may maintain traditional separations and construct an illusion of divine purity that acts as a bulwark against abject horror. Yet the very fragility of this illusion turns into a prison of our own making, one policed by fear and shame. Alternatively, we may break the walls of this prison and cross into the zones of taboo, embracing rather than cowering from the horror that lies yonder. We may be devoured by monsters beyond the pale until there is nothing that sets us apart from them. Yet in this disastrous intimacy, freedom from the tyranny of artificial distinctions could also be discovered. And with it, the kind of redemptive revelation available to those who, like Bruce, are no longer fearful and are no longer ashamed. So thank you, Adam, for, uh, for providing us with this context. And um, I think we're, we're ready for questions, unless Adam wants to say a few words. Uh, to guide the questions forward. <laughs> let, let, while you're all getting your your heads together, uh, I, I know that 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 happens, uh, and and people need need some time to process. Uh, let, let me just say a few things off the top of my head to respond to Dan because uh, we 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 can't let that performance go on. Un <laughs> too, and I I feel like you know I knew Dan way back as a grad student. Uh, at Pitt, and and I always welcomed his 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 uh, presence, um, uh, 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 and I never thought about it as being connected to to Lenny Bruce. But now I can't think about it as being unconnected from Lenny Bruce, uh, and I just think it's a perfect response. Uh, uh, I I couldn't have asked for better because I I think what Dan puts his finger on so. Uh, 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 passionately and provocatively is, is the idea that the, the sort of Jewishness that I'm talking about here in this project is really much more a matter of sensibility than of definition, right? You know, to be a Jew, you've got to be this, you've got to be that, you, 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 you've got to experience this, you've got to experience that. But what comes through so clearly in that Lenny Bruce monologue. And, and I got to say, I, I feel kind of guilty that I pushed Dan to be uh, a PhD and not a stand-up comedian, because I think he actually could have, he could have succeeded in that realm too, um, uh, and probably made more money. Uh, but the, 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 the way in which talking about Jewish horror as a matter of sensibility leads almost inevitably to Jewish humor. Which, which is something that is much more uh, acknowledged and written about. And, and, and I have to say that one of the books that's been very inspiring for me in this project, which, which I haven't uh, mentioned, but I recommend uh, highly for, for all of you. Um, my daughter is clearly a fan too, you can hear in the background, uh, is, is uh, a book by a dear friend and colleague, uh, Jeremy Dauber. Um, and he wrote a brilliant book called uh, uh, Jewish Comedy. And uh, he subtitled it A Serious History in, in, a, in a very Jewish comedic way. Uh, and um, it, it is a wonderful uh, model, I think, for what I'm trying to do with this book in that he doesn't spend his time sorting out, you know, what is not Jewish and what's actually Jewish and, 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 and why, but, but sort of like, what are the patterns that we see over and over again? And, and what are the sort of uh, the animating uh, forces behind those patterns? And I think Dan is absolutely right that shame and fear uh, uh, are, are, are extremely important in those, in those uh, forces, uh, especially in a post-Holocaust context. And, uh, but, but Jeremy traces this, you know, all the way back to, to Aramaic, you know, and, and I mean, it, 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 it's, it's remarkable how the, what we think of as the modern Jewish sensibility was there from, from the very beginnings, it seems. And, uh, 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 and, and, and I think it does have to do with this relation to the world whether it's through horror or humor, that is sort of uh, a, a uh, 
a feint and a and a and an attack at the same time, and uh, and 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 that this is what the Jewish relation to Jewishness is sort of uh, organized around, and 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 I think that's in my imagination, at least, that's what I'm trying to have be the center of gravity for the cases that I'm going to include in the book, which 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 could be really infinite and endless, I have to say. Like, like I, I mean, I feel like, you know, crack hour is really possessing me at this point in that, that like, I feel like every stone I, I, I turn over, I find a new pathway into Jewish horror. And, uh, and, and, and the book, you know, is, is just uh, getting bigger and, and bigger. Um, and, and I'm gonna have to do the hard work at some point of really making some hard choices about what stays in and what gets left out. And maybe this has to be, you know, a multi-volume study, you know, uh, uh, you know, you guys will let me know whether you're willing to read that because if you guys aren't willing to read it, then, then, then nobody is. Um, but, uh, 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 you know, I'm, I'm still working through that. And just as, as an example, um, uh, I don't know how many of you have seen it, um, but there's actually a recent uh, uh, film, uh, very Jewish, sensibility film directed by a woman um, that I think fits the project like hand in glove. Um, and and, and I, I am going to include it, even though lots of critics have not recognized this film as a horror film, but if you're Jewish and you watch this film, you will instantly recognize it as a horror film. It's called Shiva Baby. And it's directed by Emma Seligman and it's a recent film. Um, it may not have made it uh, 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 to streaming in Israel yet, but in America, you can you can watch it on Amazon if you're willing to pay for it. Uh, and um, I recommend it highly. And 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 I think you all, more than most audiences, will understand what I mean when I say that this is a Jewish horror film. Uh, even though it's got no monsters, it's got no supernatural occurrences, it has no severed heads or decapitated bodies, um, but it is horror from opening frame to last. And, and that doesn't mean it's not funny because it, it, it is, but I, I, I welcome that discussion when you guys have a chance to have seen that film as well. And uh, you know, hopefully for a future, a future time. But yeah, the floor, the floor is open. You've heard enough from me. R really looking forward to hearing from all of you. Yeah, so questions. Uh, let's uh, all try to destroy Adam's dream of keeping this project <laughs> manageable uh, by giving him more ideas. Um, yeah, the floor is yours. Who wants to start? Alex, <clears throat> you feel Hello, free to Adam. jump in. <laughs> Thank you so much for your amazing lecture, as always. Thank you, Alex. Good to see you. Yes, you too. Uh, my question is, uh, maybe you mentioned that or not, I'm not sure. Uh, so whether you intend to include um, the influence of uh, Jewish religious and cultural, uh, cultural uh, monstrous uh, demonic tradition, any motifs found in Torah and other ancient texts, its influence on their contemporary horror film genre as a whole if there is any influence at all. Thank you, thank you, Alex. Um, and and you, uh, you've given me a great question to also address something I think that was important in Dan's uh, response as well, which is, which is the idea that, that even Krakauer, um, who like most uh, uh, Jewish intellectuals um, was somewhat distant um, from religious Judaism in the traditional sense, but was, what was, but was deeply engaged and inspired by it as well, um, is that I, I think you're right, Alex, that I'm going to have to engage that tradition in some way. And, and, and one of the ways I'm, I'm, I'm sort of initially thinking about it is, is because Krakauer is so uh, important to the project, I mean, even tracing what happens between Krakauer and Buber is a really interesting case study for what happens when, even within this small circle of, of, of powerful German Jewish 
intellectuals animated by, by Jewish mysticism and, and a sort of return to Jewish uh, 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 folk belief in a particular historical period. So there's lots of things binding these people together. But Krakauer and Buber wind up hating each other. And, 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 and if you're interested in following this, Krakauer has this review of, of Buber and Rosenzweig's uh, uh, translation of, of, of the Hebrew Bible into German that just lays waste to the project in, in, in a way of sort of saying like, these guys wouldn't know the sacred if it came up and, and bit them, you know? And, 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 and his sense is the sacred is not religious, the sacred is material. The sacred is the physical world. And these guys don't get that. And, and, and therefore their translation of this Bible is sort of uh, misbegotten because it, it, it doesn't deal with the world as we live in it. And um, I, I, I don't think this is an entirely uh, justified uh, dismissal of, 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 an, of an incredible intellectual project. And, and I think both Buber and Rosenzweig are major Jewish intellectuals that, that deserve more engagement than Krakauer gives them in this review. But it, it's symptomatic of, of a kind of tension between the secular and the religious, even within this sort of uh, genealogy of Jewish thought that I'm trying to tap into with uh, with with the Jewish horror film, and and we can see this playing out in 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 uh, in contemporary film and television production. Like thanks to Dan, I've I've spent a chunk of of, of the pandemic immersing myself in uh, Judah, the the uh, the Israeli Jewish vampire show. I, I see many snickerings. Yes, I, I took it seriously because Dan said, Adam, you got to deal with this, and I have to say, I enjoyed the hell out of it because it, it is so wildly and gleefully absurd that it, 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 it gives a sense, Alex, that your question is already something the films have sort of gotten ahead of in a certain way. Like, like they know they can tap into all of this Jewish mysticism and folklore and history um, uh, but then they can also sort of, it's to the point now where they can even make fun of a move like that and, 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 and sort of make it uh, 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 almost, almost absurd and, 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 and ridiculous rather than just a, a sort of a serious quotation of here's why you need to take what I'm doing seriously because I am in conversation with a longer intellectual tradition and a longer set of philosophical and cultural concerns. Um, so, uh, you, you know, I, I, I think the jury is still out about sort of what I'm going to do in relation to sort of, you know, how much the, the engagement with religious uh, 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 sort of um, uh, context is going to be horrific and how much is going to be humorous, but, but it's, it's, you're right that it's got to be in there. And, and I'm going to rely on people like you and Dan to uh, hold my hand through that. So. I will be back to you on that, Alex. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions from the audience? I see Ido's hand. Ido, chime in. Hi. Hi, Ido. Yes. So, um, first of all, uh, thank you very much, uh, Adam. It was fascinating, and the book sounds great and like a much needed contribution to our studies. Um, that means so a lot coming from you, Ido. So, thank you. <laughs> thank you. While, while I was listening, so yeah, as you know, um, I am interested in the subject, so I had many, many ideas popping in my head uh, throughout the lecture. I'll try um, to just focus on the chapter about uh, Israeli cinema and I'll try to be yeah. uh, coherent. <laughs> and um, so I, again, maybe I missed it because um, I had so many ideas popping in, in my head, but I'm not sure that I've heard a clear definition of what is uh, your idea about um, the difference, if there is a difference between a Jewish film and a Jewish horror film and an Israeli horror film. What is the connection between this chapter and all the chapters that preceded it? Is it um, uh, the same thing? Because it sounds like uh, you are about to uh, discuss uh, the Aaron Keshalis and Papu Shadows films and the uh, Fazbada's films as 
another um, is more of the Jewish horror film. Um, so uh, is it a new stage in, in, the, in the evolution of the Jewish film? Is it different? Is it more of the same? And also, um, I think that uh, by focusing on Keshalis and Papushado and the Paz brothers, um, I, I can understand and these are definitely the most uh, successful film, maybe the most watched Israeli horror films. Um, but I, I'm not sure that focusing only on them will give an accurate portrayal of the, this wide title of the Israeli horror film. There is, as, as, as I know that, you know, yeah, a whole group of Israeli horror films set in army bases about Israeli war and stuff like this. Um, um, but and I'm also wondering in the case specifically of Kishalis and Papushado and the Paz Brothers, the Paz Brothers, it's, it's so um, obvious because the films are uh, containing a lot of English. Jerusalem contains a lot of English dialogue with uh, protagonists who are tourists visiting Jerusalem. And the golem is entirely English speaking, probably made for foreign viewers, even though they are Israeli films. Um, so, and also with Kishalis and Papushado, um, now, as we know, they're both about to present their first English-speaking uh, international production. Uh, Papa Shadow's film Gunpowder Milchek will, will be premiering on Netflix in, in a few months from now. Um, so I also wonder maybe um, the commercial aspect has a lot to do with the fact that they're more Jewish than Israelis. Um, um, yeah, OK, so th this, this was my way too long monologue. So no. 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 No, not, not, not too long at all. In fact, Ido, I'm going to uh, make you promise in front of all of these witnesses that you are going to send me a annotated list of your sense of the Israeli horror films outside of Kishalas, Papushado, Paz Brothers that, that really are important to consider. Because I, I, I want to know, I mean, I asked for that list from Dan and it was so long and intimidating that like I, I filed it away under like, I don't have time to deal with this now. So I, I am gonna have to eventually deal with this. And, and, and Ido, I know you have a particular expertise. So please, you know, try, try to give me your sense of, of you know, if Kashalas and Papushado and the Paz brothers are not really representative, then like w what of these other films sort of speak to, to aspects of Israeli horror that are important to capture that, that their films don't because I, I really do want to know and I absolutely believe you that that they're there and um, even some of the things I've seen recently like um, uh, I saw the film Happy Times uh, which sort of made a bit of a splash uh, I can't remember what the Israeli title was um, but uh, again probably not marketed as a horror film but but very dark it's very it's a very like Bunuel inspired sort of uh, uh, endless dinner where people kill each other off. It's, it's all set in the Israeli uh, diaspora community in Los Angeles, you know, which is already, you know, a, 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 <laughs> a setting for horror, right? In all kinds of ways. Um, but Happy Times, I think like those army based movies is, is sort of like capturing Israeli horror in a way that's different than what the, the Paz brothers are doing. That's different what Kashalas and Papashada are doing. Um, so, so I very much do want that chapter to have a more well-rounded sense of what Israeli horror contains. But, but my, my, my conviction um, uh, that goes to your original question, Ido, about um, what separates Israeli horror from Jewish horror, what connects Israeli horror to Jewish horror, really comes out of the way that the discourse around Israeli horror has begun to be articulated. And, 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 and here I, I, I'm very much indebted to uh, uh, our friend and, and your colleague, I know, uh, Olga Gershenson's work. Um, she's written a, 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 an important article uh, about um, Kishalis and Papushado, um, which, which, which I'm, I'm, I'm very glad is there, but I, I disagree with its thrust, which is that contemporary Israeli horror has almost nothing to do with Jewishness at all. You know, I mean, her argument in that piece is that those Kishalis and Papushado films 
are about Israeli national identity, almost divorced from Jewish concerns. And so it's all about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and, and, and nothing to do uh, with the Holocaust or, 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 or the founding of Israel or a longer history of, of Jewishness. Um, and, and I think the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, of course, is in those films. How could it not be? Um, but, but I think there's other things in those films that testify to this longer, deeper history and sensibility that actually connects Israeli horror to Jewish horror in a broader, more capacious way that leaves room for figures like everyone from Golan and Globus to uh, uh, Mayor Zarchai to, uh, uh, to Charles Griffith. I mean, all these people I've been talking with Dan about uh, as, as I've sort of delved into sort of Israeli horror in the diasporic uh, tradition as well. And these are people coming to Israel and, 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 and uh, from horror traditions outside of Israel and attempting to make films in Israel or Israelis leaving Israel and making films that, that have connections to international horror traditions, but with profound Israeli sensibilities stamped into them. Um, so, uh, you know, there's, there's ways to answer this question of, of, of the relationship between the Jewish horror film and the Israeli horror film that I think are gonna wind up being um, more capacious and more complicated than just more of the same or just like, oh, they're completely divorced from each other. They have nothing to do with each other. That's, that's all I can give you right now. But, 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 but as it develops, like I, I definitely am, am excited about how much Israeli horror um, offers already and, and will continue to offer on this, this front of, of imagining Jewish horror, um, uh, not just in the past, but, 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 but for the future as well. Thank you. And uh, by the way, just as an anecdote, uh, like you found the connection between the third and the fourth chapter in, in uh, John Landis as the, as the link between them, then I suggest, I was thinking about um, the, the missing link between uh, the last chapter about the Israeli films and one before could be Quentin Tarantino. Um, because Keshalis and Papushado are no less protege of Tarantino than Eli Roth nowadays. And Tarantino, of course, made in Glorious Bastard and now living in North Tel Aviv and uh, young Mary too. Uh, Thank you. Thank Israeli you. Yes. Yes. Um, I, I'd like to piggyback a little bit about what about Ido's um, comment and question. Um, and also in terms of the connection between uh, the Israeli section and the werewolf section, because I was, um, I'm interested in this idea of, of transformation um, because there is something, there is of course, a, 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 the werewolf is a transformation narrative, but with all the, the special effects and the kind of hokey special effects at times, we're, we're wondering whether this is transformation or masquerading and perhaps the ambivalence between the two makes the distinction, uh, especially in terms of agency, uh, not that clear. And for me, that connects to the Israeli films because, in, in, in many ways, in certain ways at least, the Israeli films very much are, are films about a transformation from a plot to an allegory about national militarism for, for sure and other aspects of, of, of uh, Israeli um, ideology or Zionist ideology. But at the same time, as far as I'm, as far as I experience these uh, horror films, they wear their allegorical uh, content on their sleeve. It's almost like a mask. So, and, the, and it doesn't necessarily require the heavy duty uh, allegorical analysis of seeking out how a 1970s horror film is reflective of, of Vietnam's post-trauma. Um, uh, they're very much uh, playing with that mask and, and, and essentially, at least for, for a literate viewer in terms of Israel literacy, uh, kind of showcasing the process of putting on a mask as if it was transformation, but rather not, or the distinctions between them are fluid. So I think 
more than I think for my in 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 my understanding of the Israeli horror films, they're less uh, the, where they're Jewish is not so much uh, at least by your model in their content so much as with the process in which they work with the content and kind of bring up this question of transformation versus active masking. So. Yeah, that's that's a, that's a great point, Dan, and 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 it helps me sort of zero in on 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 something I was feeling in the texture of a lot of these Jewish horror films that I couldn't quite put uh, a name to, but 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 your suggestion of of sort of um, performance in a certain mm -hmm. way, you know, you know, allegory as performance rather than allegory as revelation, right? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Is 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 I think a good way of of putting it in and think about, you know, uh, uh, I, I hate to create more cringes in the audience. Uh, I'm, I'm curious, I'm curious to get the general sense of, of Judah from the Israeli perspective. But I, I mean, in Judah, you know, there's this sequence where there's like a sort of insertion of like a waltz with Bashir type of like animated uh, sequence to tell us the backstory about about you know how the the Jewish vampire was created, and it of course it has to do with the Holocaust, and 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 it, it it's effective, and 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 it's it's well crafted, but you almost get the sense that like as Dan is suggesting that it's it's like, yeah, I've seen Waltz with Bashir, and like I I know how to how to do this, and what it ends up like the final gesture is is is, is that sequence is not sort of given to us as like oh no, this is all about the Holocaust. Like it gets to a point where like the, it, it ends in a punchline where like the rabbi who's been training Judah as a, as, a, as a sort of commando Jewish vampire reveals that it's he himself who knocked out Hitler during the war because he's a vampire himself. So the rabbi is a, a, a vampire and he's training the new Jewish vampire. And so the whole thing like, becomes this very uh, uh, comedic um, construct, um, but, 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 but it's very much dealing with real and painful things. Mm -hmm. Like, and this is not like a, a Holocaust denial sort of uh, 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 text, um, but like the, 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 the sort of, the shifts in tone, I guess, is what I'm talking about here, you know, from, from, you know, we're gonna evoke these things that we know are very painful and traumatic to like, we're gonna make them into punchlines is, 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 is a very interesting thing that's happening in the Israeli context that's sort of like at warp speed versus what's happening with Jewish horror in the non-Israeli uh, spectrum, I would and say. And also bringing up Freud and Gallo's humor and his idea of the, right. the humorous in that respect. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, Freud. <laughs> Freud loved jokes almost as much as he liked horror. So and it's, cocaine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so these are all things to keep, to keep to keep in conversation. For sure. Of course. <laughs> More questions from the audience. Inputs. Don't be shy. I'm not as scary as as my topics are. <laughs> no. Yes. Uh, hi. Thank you for a, a wonderful lecture. Um, I think perhaps part of the difference between what we discuss as Jewish whole and Israeli whole has to do with funding and with material conditions. I think um, <clears throat> that perhaps part of the reason uh, Israeli whole is often a uh, whole comedy, and I'm thinking about films like uh, uh, even Yuval Mendelssohn's Cats on a Pedal Boat, if which are kind of satires of, of uh, whole films, uh, has to do with kind of, you know, the punchline is just a way of not committing to actually creating such a suspense uh, and horrific uh, atmosphere or diagesis, perhaps at times due to uh, financial, uh, financial uh, restraints. So it's easier not to take on the full responsibility of I'm going to scare you and instead just give a wink to the audience. And so I was just thinking if the material uh, connection, background comes into play uh, somehow. Yes, thank you, Dor. That, 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 that's, that's a great reminder um, that, that there are strong industry 
uh, concerns to, to, to think about here. And, and even, you know, the, the, the relationship between film and television production in Israel too is, is such an important uh, relationship to, to think about and, uh, and, and, and how so much power in Israel uh, comes from the television industry and, uh, uh, and, and sort of, of course, TV approaches to genre tend to be somewhat different from uh, uh, film approaches to genre. And, and, and I think, you know, part of what you are putting your finger on may have to do with a, a sort of bleed over effect from the success of Israeli television, um, sort of informing the structure of these films. Um, but, but clearly I, I, I need to watch more of the films uh, to, to sort of talk about this more uh, authoritatively. And, and, and I've, I've never heard of Cats on a Paddle Boat, at you, but I, I'm in love already with, with the title. It's um, very esoteric. <laughs> I, I, I'm down with esoteric. So that, that, that sounds, that sounds great. Um, and yeah, I mean, I mean, a, a, any, any, you know, films, uh, or, or examples that people have, um, uh, you know, you know, please don't be afraid to send them along to me to email me or throw them in the chat. And, um, uh, you know, I, I, I'm looking forward to getting to all of them, but but absolutely. I mean, I'm 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 you know uh, I I'm I know that in the Israeli context in particular, I'm I'm really depending on you all to sort of uh, help me out here. And, and if I hadn't had these series of talks that I've done uh, at Tel Aviv University over the last few years, like I'm not sure I would have I would have had the nerve to include an Israeli chapter. Uh, in in the book, so um, so you know, it's your fault, guys. So now you have to <laughs> you have to you have to help me uh, get out of the hole. Um, but but there's certainly like a lot for me to learn here, of course. And uh, uh, and this 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 all the comments so far have been remarkably uh, helpful in 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 that way. But but I'm sure there's there's also more. Um, uh, I see, Dan, there was a question in the chat. Yes, can, can you elaborate about the parodic aspect of Judah and how it is in conversation with other Jewish war parodies? Like I, bet whoever, I bet whoever asked the question can probably answer that better than <laughs> I can. I, I mean, are there other sorts of examples that, that we should be throwing Probably, uh, well, if you count Mel Brooks' Young Frankenstein as a Jewish horror film, uh, yeah. horror parody. For maybe. sure. Well, Vered is here, like, go, go ahead. Vered. Genuine question. Sorry, my, my microphone is a bit off. Uh, this is a genuine question, not, not a question uh, that uh, suggests I can answer it. It's, uh, it's a, a genuine question um, about the, the, the parodic aspects of, of Judah and yeah. how they might be linked to right. other Jewish horror parodies. Yeah. Not, not a question meant to, um, oh. to yeah, a genuine question. I, I, I appreciate that. A genuine question is, 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 is wonderfully rare to encounter, so thank you. Uh, the, the, you know, I think, I think Dan's right. There's something about like young Frankenstein that, that sort of get to this. Also, I think of Fearless Vampire Killers, you know, the Roman Polanski, you know, which is uh, uh, central, I think. And, and, and you know, I, I have to admit, and maybe the climate will change. I, I hope it does. But, but, but right now, I could not get a US publisher to publish a book on Jewish horror that has a chapter about Roman Polanski. It, it just would not be accepted, it would not fly. And uh, uh, an editor, actually, I was talking about this with an editor and he said, he said the best way for you to approach that is to put in a chapter with all blank pages on, on, on Roman Polanski, but, but, but include footnotes, just, just no, no, no text. Uh, and I think this is a really unfortunate place that we're in right now where that's uh, the case. Uh, and I hope it changes because I do feel like um, Polanski is an absolutely central figure here and, and he does need to be dealt with. Um, uh, but, but again, I'm not sure, you know, that's going to be 
possible. Um, but but if I were allowed to write about Polanski, um, uh, of course, you know, this is the guy who brought us not only Rosemary's Baby and 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 the Pianist and 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 the new Dreyfus movie, which I haven't seen. Um, uh, but, but fearless vampire killers too. And the tenant, I mean, the tenant is like, I mean, Lenny Bruce would say the tenant is so Jewish, right? It is totally Jewish. And, uh, it, you know, it, 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 you know, these films haven't been reckoned with in, in, in a Jewish context. And, uh, and I think they need to be, and like for them, to be reckoned with in a Jewish context. I mean, horror has to be an integral part of that conversation. Um, but, but again, um, I, I hope there's a time where that's possible, but that time is not now. Go on. Hi, uh, thank you for a fascinating talk. Hi, Bob. Um, I Hi. I, I was wondering if there are any um, American-born Jewish theorists that, or critics that you found useful, because your title does allude to Krakauer and Benjamin and to Freud. Um, is Suzanne Zontag's, um, are, are her ideas about evil, about seeing horrific images useful? Is Pauline Kael useful? Stanley yeah. Cavell? Yeah, yeah. No, thank thank you, Boaz. Uh, uh, you know, as always, you 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 tune in right away to great great uh, uh, pathways through the project, and 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 I do think people like Sontag and 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 Kale, you know, the sort of uh, critics who who um, participate in this tradition um, are are almost legion. You know, I mean, I mean, the, 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 there's a way in which sort of, uh, uh, you know, um, dimensions of, of sort of post-war intellectual film criticism uh, in America, and 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 Krakauer is part of this, although sort of um, to the side a bit, is 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 in certain ways a sort of a Jewish enterprise, and and you know the way it springs out of these Jewish intellectual journals, you know, like Commentary and. And, and there's so much, uh, you know, the whole concept of the New York intellectuals, right? I mean, they're basically Jewish intellectuals, like, like that, that, that's what they have in common even more than New York as, as the place that they're uh, uh, gravitating around. So, I, I mean, I, I, I do think, you know, especially as I delve deeper into Hannah Arendt, like I, I think there's gonna be a way in which that, that sort of Jewish intellectual critical tradition is gonna wind up getting bigger and broader and, 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 and will likely touch on people like Susan Sontag for sure. Um, uh, but again, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure yet how much I can stuff into, into one book. And, and uh, you know, some of it might have to become uh, articles or maybe even a second sort of project, you know, after this project. Like, like, I mean, I wasn't imagining writing this book until I was writing the horror film in otherness, you know, which is, which is the book that's, that's, that's done, but not out yet. Um, and, uh, but it was in the process of writing that book when, when the process kind of happened, like you're describing Boaz, where, where it was like, oh, Jewish horror is not like this, this, you know, uh, uh, sort of um, special, uh, subsection of, of horror's relation to otherness, it's actually a whole tradition in its own right. And, and it like deserves its own book. So, so maybe they'll, they'll come to a point, especially, you know, as I dig into to Krakauer and, 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 and intellectual scene, um, that, that there emerges a sort of, uh, you know, something like Jewish film theory, right? You know, like, 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 like an idea that like, there's enough Jewish thinkers within the classical and contemporary film theory tradition to say that there's something like Jewish film theory out there. And not that like it's being invented right now, but that it, it's, it's been there all the way through and we just haven't seen it and we haven't recognized it and, 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 and we haven't known how to look for it often because the people writing it the last thing they wanted to be identified as is, is Jews, 
like they, 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 they were, I mean, that, that, that was the opposite of their goal, right? Um, and, and so I, I, I'm excited to think about how this might spin out into uh, larger claims like, like that. And, uh, uh, and, 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 and I, 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 I'm daunted by it, but, I, by, but I'm also excited about the prospect of it and uh, looking forward to, to asking you more about it as I, as I, as I develop it below. Um, Inbo asks uh, on chat, uh, Victor Miller, who wrote Friday the 13th, is 8th or 16th a Jew? <laughs> Inbo knows, knows, the, knows, the, knows the genealogy tree. There are other fraction Jews making horror films. Um, are you going to address them too? In your volume? This, this whole seen? question, yeah. I mean, I mean, I'm sure you guys have all seen all the... Uh, the stand-up sort of comedy routines about like, you know, Jew or not Jew. And, and like, you know, you present all these people and you're shocked to find out that these very goyish seeming people, as Lenny Bruce would say, are, are, are Jewish, you know, or, or they're one quarter Jewish or they're one sixteenth Jewish. And I'm not so interested in, in the family tree thing as, as I am in what happens when Jewishness as a sort of uh, lived sensibility encounters art, you know, and and uh, I, I uh, maybe someone here can can convince me otherwise. But right now, I don't feel that in Friday the Thirteenth in a in a in a in a visceral way, in a visceral enough way to sort of have me press on. It's valuable to read this film as a Jewish horror film. Um, Again, I'm not saying I'm shutting the door on that. And, 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 and if somebody can come to me and say, you know, here's why you need to rethink that position, I'm, I'm open to it. But I, I'm structuring the cases on what's there in the films themselves and, 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 and not so much on, uh, you know, well, this person is Jewish or this person says they're Jewish or this person says they're not Jewish. Or I, I mean, a lot of the films in, in the book are not directed by Jews. I mean, they, 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 they are films that are directed by non-Jews about Jews, but, but, but that doesn't make them uh, divorced from, from the category of Jewish horror. And by the same token, I would not want to make a 1 16th Jew included <laughs> purely because he's got 1 16th Jew in him. Um, so, you know, uh, it's really, again, a, a sort of a matter of strategic uh, uh, mobilization rather than sort of comprehensive uh, inclusion. But, but I, I, I love, uh, you, know, you know, if you want to send me an email on that too, I love getting that too. Like, did you know that X and X is, 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 is 1 16th Jew? Like, I, 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 I like to have a database on those things in case I need to, to consult it. But it, it, it's, it's, it's not the thing that's driving uh, the project, um, but but you know, the, these are going to be issues too that come out. I think like 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 when I actually talk to Eli Roth and Ari Aster, like I don't know what's going to happen there. I mean, I have friends who know them, who have talked to them, who suggest that once I sort of ask them about this, they're going to sort of spit it all out. Um, but they may say. I have no idea what you're talking about. That has nothing to do with me. And like, you know, and how dare you accuse me of being a Jew anyway? Like, well, why, where'd you get the idea that I'm Jewish anyway? Uh, no, that's exaggeration. I, I don't think that will happen. But, 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 but I do feel like this is not something that people are asking them um, because it's still, all these years from Lenny Bruce, it's still not always considered something you can talk about or should talk about, so. I wonder how you uh, situate, um, because these are two figures that are kind of not discussing their, their Jewishness, but in the context of the horror they're, they're doing uh, in the US, but they're, you know, if you take uh, into the equation, Brian Singer or the Coen brothers who have very explicit horrific Jewish aspects of their filmmaking, um, which are in a sense excluded because that's the first, almost always not the first, but maybe the second or the third question 
that get asked about them, but how does that relationship play out in, in your argument? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I think a perfect place to sort of uh, anchor this, this, this question right now is David Cronenberg, yeah. because Cronenberg is, is a hardcore atheist who, who, who was raised by parents who had drifted from Judaism, you know, before Cronenberg was, was born. He was not brought up with any kind of religious Jewishness, but he has always said, I am a Jew. And, and, and I've had to figure out my own way of being Jewish. And I've gone through life sometimes intimidated by the things I don't know about what it means to be Jewish. But you can see in his films a steady arc where Jewishness becomes more and more important the older he gets. And, uh, and, and, and now that he's almost 80, I believe, um, he, is, he is making, I'm, I'm so happy to hear this news, he, he's, he's got a new film in production and it's called Crimes of the Future, which is a riff on the title of one, his, one of his earliest films. So I, I, I bet this is gonna be a sort of career summary kind of statement. And I am willing to bet my bottom dollar that, that Jewishness is going to be important in this film, whether it's implicit or explicit, in a quite spectacular way. Um, because it's been building ever, ever, ever since the beginning. And again, this has nothing to do with Cronenberg as a religious Jew, as a practicing Jew, as an observant Jew, or even as like a philosophical Jew, you know, I mean, it has to do with the sense that this is a history and a sensibility that I belong to in some way. Um, and, and indeed, he made a short film in 2007 where he cast himself, and it's called At the Suicide of the Last Jew in the World in the Last Cinema in the World. So if that's not Jewish, I, I don't know what is, right? I mean, Cronenberg is, is, is a super Jew based on that film alone, right? Mm. Um, but again, that wouldn't qualify him in, in sort of strict definitional kinds of categories about like, is this a Jewish filmmaker? Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and indeed, you know, I haven't had a chance to sit down with him and talk about this yet either, and I hope to, but like, I, 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 I'm not sure he would say himself like, yeah, the most accurate way to think about me is, 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 is as a Jewish filmmaker. I, mm -hmm. I, I, I highly doubt that. But I also think he would not deny that this is something that's in his work that that is is something that hardly anyone has has grappled with yet. Yeah. Then you get filled to flesh. <laughs> that's right. Steve, uh, you should have been a comedian. Yeah. I I, well, I you can you use every well. chapter. <laughs> you have uh, you're having your virtual hand up, right? Is this is this a mistake? Yeah, you are. Yeah. Hi, uh, hi Adam. Thanks. Hi. Thanks for the fascinating lecture. Uh, uh, Dan, last comment uh, uh, made my uh, question a little bit obvious, but uh, I wanted to uh, to test my uh, if I got right the sensibility of a Jewish the Jewish uh, horror movie, and I was fascinated by the your identification of the. Of Get Out as a as, as a film that uh, has a Jewish feeling with of of fear and shame, and I thought about the obvious uh, No Country for Old Men, and I wanted to ask you, like making the white American film like like Jewish with uh, a shame and fear and without the ability to test it uh, 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 more uh, with no uh, ability to take it to test it more morally in in any moral way. Yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you, Yoav. And 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 I can't remember if you were there, but several of you were there when I gave a talk uh, at Tel Aviv University uh, several years back. That was a a sort of an early version of the Get Out uh, Jewishness uh, sort of uh, connection. And uh, and that, now that chapter uh, has been uh, published, and an expanded version of it is going to be in the horror film and otherness book. And and so I can I can tell you that. Uh, you know, because Jordan Peele has been so uh, frank and explicit about saying, you know, he literally says, I come from the Ira Levin school of writing. Like, that's what he says. 
he doesn't say I come from the Jewish school of writing, but by invoking Ira Levin, he's invoking a, a, a tradition of Jewish horror. And, and, um, and Levin, um, you know, is, is, is almost as Jewish as Philip Roth in terms of like the, 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 the sensibility in those books. But, but what comes in Roth is an explicit evocation of Jews and Jewishness that 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 doesn't often happen in Ira Levin, although although it's there in in, in particularly in the Stepford Wives in, in a really interesting way. Um, but the idea that there's something about the experience of minoritization, right? Whether you're a woman, a Jew, a black, uh, 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 a queer person. Um, whatever, you, if you're in a minority relation to majority society, there are going to be things that you experience that feel like not just shame and horror and fear, but, but paranoia, potential paranoia, right? Like, is this person making fun of me because I'm a Jew? Or, or is this person just good naturedly asking questions about what it means to be a Jew because they don't know any better and they don't know how to ask. And, and I, I know you guys have gone through hell in the last few weeks, but like in America as a Jew, the things we've experienced on this front have, have been remarkable in, in terms of, you know, getting questions from well-meaning people, you know, saying things like, well, well, what do you have to, say about it. and like can't you explain what's going on in Israel and can't you tell us what Jewish identity means and like you know uh, uh, and, and what the hell is going on over there anyway and and, and, it, and it's like you know there, there there's a way in which and I would never say this is the same thing as what black people experience or what women experience or what queer people experience, because none of these differences are equivalent, but they are in conversation with each other. And I think that's what Get Out realizes and activates. And that's why I think it's such an important film is that blackness is its center of gravity, but because it's coming out of that Ira Levin tradition, it understands how minoritization is something that doesn't belong to blackness alone. And because of Levin, it's Jewishness that's the conversant minoritization. So, I mean, that's, that's the way I'm seeing that set of relationships. But again, it's a very tricky thing because, uh, and again, I want to re-emphasize, I, I am not saying that any of these forms of difference are equivalent or interchangeable. They're not. They come with separate histories. They come with separate social privileges and, 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 uh, uh, and prejudices. Um, but I think we can learn something about all of them by looking at them in concert with each other, rather than just saying the only way to talk about Jewishness is through Jewishness. The only way to talk about blackness is through blackness. I just don't think that's the best way for us to proceed. And I don't think it's the best way to build any kind of solidarity between these forms of minority experience. Thanks. Does that help you all? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions from the floor? Was there stuff in the in the chat? I lost track of the chat here. Um, there are a few. There's a list uh, of a few films to think about um, in, in the Israeli context. Then Ido, well, he he put his article, which you're already yes. uh, yes. very familiar Excellent. with. Uh, so I guess the right for a last question is mine. Um, yeah. And um, I, first of all, I want to say how much I appreciate the fact that you brought up Wadeb uh, uh, Shalom and what happened in Pittsburgh and I, uh, I lived not too far away from that synagogue for a good few years. And uh, it's very much, uh, yeah, it hit home, it hit very close to home. Um, and I, but I wanted to, to, to focus on, on that place that you articulated 
um, that brought that brought out this project in a, in a way. Um, and I noted that that you said that in the face of that horror, that 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 horror that that emerges out of nowhere and uh, and takes hold, um, you found language to overcome fear. In your words. And I was thinking about this, and I was wondering if you can speak to it um, in terms of Jewish horror, because we usually think about horror films more along the lines of evoking fear uh, rather than you know overcome being fixated on overcoming fear but i was wondering whether in your mind the type of jewish horror that you describe which is a type of jewishness and the type of horror that are combined in your definitions has more to do with overcoming fear than with provoking it so maybe you can help thank you dan thank you dan that that's a fascinating uh, distinction. Um, and, uh, and it comes back in certain ways to earlier parts of this conversation. Uh, I'm thinking especially about the sort of the distinction about uh, uh, Israeli horror as sort of almost always tongue in cheek in some sort of way and, 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 and sort of not willing to sort of make the commitment to like, I'm gonna scare the hell out of you, right? Like, I mean, in some ways that seems like a very non-Israeli stance right like i mean it, 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 it's easier to imagine someone like stephen king who actually has a hilarious film version where he does this for his preview for maximum overdrive a terrible movie where he he gets on camera and says i'm gonna scare the hell out of you and and he doesn't and and and, and maybe that's why that seems like a very un, uh, unlikely position for israelis to to inhabit right um, so I, I think there is something about that uh, overcoming versus provoking um, that that does need further thought. It needs to be worked out. And 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 one of the things that I'm uh, I, I'm happy to report. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm into horror. I'm, I'm not into providing happy endings. But 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 I feel like you guys have provided such wonderful conversation that you deserve a little a little uh, happy ending here at the end. Is that I don't know if the news has has come to 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 you guys yet, um, but um, the the reconstruction of the Tree of Life uh, synagogue in Pittsburgh, the site of the the massacre, um, is going to be handled by Daniel Liebeskind, uh, mm. who's the famous uh, Jewish architect, uh, uh, son of Holocaust survivors, who 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 who. Uh, designed the Jewish Museum in Berlin and One World Trade Center in New York. And so th this is not just gonna be a remodeled synagogue. This is gonna be a, a national and internationally significant center for Jewish culture in the place where one of the most horrible crimes against Jewish culture was committed in the US. Um, and so I see that as a very hopeful development and, uh, uh, and, 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 and I hope that, you know, among the cultural programming that that place will provide is a space to talk about Jewish horror in the way that we've been talking about it today. You know, that, that, that there's a way in which Jewish horror can be included in a Jewish tradition of thinking, feeling, belonging, rather than having it be sort of divorced from things that are really Jewish or actually Jewish or, or, or uh, uh, substantively Jewish um, uh, or even, you know, proudly Jewish versus, you know, sort of shamefully Jewish, right? And, and you know, I, I, I do hope that that's possible and I'm sure the Liebeskin architectural model is going to, uh, uh, is going to suggest that in some kind of ways is, is, is my hope um, because I, I can't tell you how hard it is even now to drive past that synagogue every day and uh, and just see it still in in it's a crime scene it's still a crime scene I mean it, it, it's it's the, the 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 tags haven't been taken off the the building is not open because they're still processing the evidence from the from the event um so 
you know, that was 2018, it's 2021. Um, so it, it's, it's not a wound that's like anywhere near healing. And, uh, and, and I think that's going to help me write this book. And, 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 and my hope is that there will be an afterward that, that is able to talk about Tree of Life in a way that's, that's not just 2018, but whatever the present moment is when, when I can get this actually done. <laughs> Well, thank you, Adam, for, um, for a wonderful talk. And thank you all for participating. Uh, I'm sure Adam would love to get your comments, ideas, questions sent to his email in case the chat yeah. doesn't work. And, and he's uh, always up for new ideas. And in general, if you want to take more part in his global horror network, then I'm sure he'll be happy to answer questions about that as well. Um, uh, it's a thriving new network and I'm sure we'll make a change in global war studies. Um, and yeah, and uh, hopefully we'll see you in the next uh, session. We'll yeah. have to we'll probably tell you more about that in the future. <laughs> thank, thank you all so much. Thank you, Dan, especially. But thank, thank you all uh, uh, for for being such a wonderful and thoughtful audience. And uh, uh, I really do look forward to continuing to share this work with you as it develops, you know, hopefully in person, um, that would be much, much better, but it's it's still a great thing to be able to see you all and, and be connected with you. And, uh, uh, and, and, and again, please don't, don't hesitate to be in touch. Uh, and, and as Dan said, you know, the, the horror studies initiatives at Pitt are are uh, are going great guns at this point, and so there's there's a lot to uh, uh, to stay uh, in touch on. And actually, let me throw into the chat. There's there's actually a a one stop shopping site now that um, that you can subscribe to a newsletter and be kept up to date on what's going on there. Um, so I put that in the chat. And uh, uh, please do check that out and subscribe, and uh, uh, you know you can learn more there. But but you can also talk to me, and uh, I'm happy to to talk to all of you. So looking forward to our next conversation. Um, thinking of you all there in Israel, and 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 thank you so much uh, for for a great a great conversation, and hopefully see you all again soon. Thank you. <laughs>